Watch this. She tried to be Idaho's first female governor. Now she's going to try to be Idaho's first female senator. Paulette Jordan says she's running for Congress, taking aim at Senator Risch's seat. You asked, we have the answer. How many of Idaho's state representatives are actually from Idaho? And how do you say it? Don't ask me, I flubbed it twice. But after a back and forth on the right way to say this northeastern Oregon town with a crystal clear lake, we finally figured it out. Just when you thought the upcoming race for Idaho's Senate seat was going to be a sleepy one, here comes Paulette Jordan. The Democratic candidate announcing today that she intends to unseat Republican Gen Senator Jim Risch this coming November. In 2018, more than 230,000 voters cast their ballot for Paulette Jordan to be the next governor of Idaho. It was the most for a Democratic gubernatorial candidate in the Gem State's history. She lost to Brad Little by a lot, but it was enough to convince the former state representative she may have a shot at Senator. And we're going to hear from Jordan, who served two terms in Idaho's House of Representatives, coming up in just a bit. Joe Paris just wrapping up a conversation with her. And while it wasn't a complete surprise to many, Jordan's formal announcement today adds to the field of those trying to take Rish's spot. The other candidates, led by Nancy Lynn Harris, who announced last fall and has raised more than $21,000, according to the Federal Election Commission. Jim Vandermoss and Travis Oler have reported any, or have not reported any campaign money. Also without cash, Ray Ritz of the Constitution Party and Natalie Fleming, who is an independent. Then, of course, there's Senator Risch, well stocked with a bankroll of more than $1.6 million. As with the governor's race, Jordan doesn't exactly have history on her side when it comes to successful Democratic candidates. Of the 29 senators to serve the state of Idaho, only or in Washington, D.C., only nine have been Democrats. There was one populist thrown in back at the turn of the last century. The last Democrat, by the way, was the very successful Frank Church, who served for 24 years until 1981. As for Senator Risch's seat specifically, only three of the 12 have been Democrat for a total of just seven years since 1890. The last one, Democratic Senator Burt Miller, who only served 10 months before dying in office in 1949. Since then, there have certainly been challenges. The closest that seat came to terming, turning Democrat was 1962, when Congressman Gracie Fost lost to Len Jordan by just 4,800 votes, a difference of 51% to 49%. So maybe Jordan can take that to heart as she begins this short journey to the primary and then possibly the general election in November. And while Jordan and Nancy Harris tried to be Idaho's first female senator, the last Democrat to make a good run at it, well, she made a pretty good one. Joe Paris, as I mentioned, the discussion with Paulette Jordan coming up in just a few minutes. Jordan's first hurdle would be the Democratic primary coming up on May 19th. And despite the attempt to change the policy, if you haven't already, as of now, you can register to vote in that primary, primary on that day. And if you do, you'll be using new voter registration software. County clerks across the state are testing it out with its debut run in the presidential primary next month. New software might sound scary, I know, especially considering what happened with the new app in Iowa this week. But they are testing it out first, and the Secretary of State's office says it's more secure and more efficient. And they say this will ensure voters that the results are accurate and protected. It will store your basic info, like your name, your party affiliation, and your address. But what the system won't do is store who you actually voted for. But that's definitely information that we want to keep secure. And again, that's one of the biggest reasons for looking at this upgrade is it allows us to put in modern, current security protocols and put those in play against new infrastructure, new system, leveraging all of the technologies that are out there. So voters will indeed see some changes at their polling location once the software is completely launched. Instead of having your name checked in the big paper book, when you get to your polling location, it'll be one of these tablets right here. So let's ask Joey Prechtel what this process is actually going to look like. Well, Brian, what this won't impact is the actual voting process. Yes, the checking in will be different with the tablet compared to the old fashioned way, but voters will still be filling out paper ballots. That part won't change. Now, of course, whenever there is a new system, there can be a few bumps in the road. We talked about it already. Just yesterday, though, 
The Secretary of State's office rolled out 35 software improvements, and those were all in response to feedback from county clerks across the state. So March, the system will be tested live, but Ada County will still be relying on their old system for that election. So the new software will just be ran in conjunction with the old one. And after that, they'll identify any issues, get those fixed up, and the plan is, is, is to have that full launch by the May primary. Okay, so they're not going full hog, or whole hog, I should say, coming up in March. So it can yeah. still be a little different depending where you go vote. Mm -hmm. Yep, and only 14 counties across Idaho will be testing it out in that March presidential primary, not oh. all of them. Okay, good to know. Thank you, Joey. Mm -hmm. We're likely nearing the halfway point of the 2020 legislative session, and already more than 300 bills have been introduced. Nearly half of those sitting somewhere in the House of Representatives. 70 representatives will, at some point, have to make their way through each one or let that bill die in committee. And that prompted Harry to text us in yesterday and ask this question. I'm curious, of the 70 House of Representatives, or members of the House of Representatives in Idaho, how many are Idaho natives? Well, that's an interesting question with a lot of possible answers. For this question, we will define Idaho natives as those who graduated high school in the gem state. Hopefully that's good enough for you. 47 representatives, or about 67% of those are native Idahoans. Of those, there are eight Democrats, 35 are Republicans, which means 23 were not born in Idaho. Eight are from California, four are from Ohio, with Texas, New Mexico, Utah, Georgia, and Pennsylvania also representing in the House of Representatives. Either way, all 70 did have to meet specific qualifications to run for office, including having lived in their district for at least one year prior to Election Day. Thanks for that question. Do you have what it takes to be a dam manager? And a follow-up question, do you have the money to be a dam owner? While I don't exactly know what it takes to be a dam manager, I've always just been an employee, I do know what it takes to be a dam owner. A large chunk of change. Ada County's hydroelectric power plant, but you may know it as Barber Dam, is up for auction. That auction was announced back in December, but potential buyers can now take an up-close look at the merchandise. Along with the structure, you'll even get a few surrounding parcels of land, but to be sure, it is a fixer-upper. Our partners at the Idaho Press report the county has owned the dam since the mid-70s, but in recent years, it has had its share of problems, including a power outage last summer that stopped the entire flow of the Boise River, for which the county was fined $50,000. So, you want to own a dam? Well, you have until March 29th to inspect it. No word on what the starting bid will be, but if you can somehow afford maybe that fallout shelter for $2.1 million and the Barber Dam, you're going to own a lot of Ada County concrete. Just hours after announcing she's running after Senator Risch's seat, we're talking with Idaho's newest congressional candidate, Paulette Jordan. Walua, Walawa, how do you say it again? We'll get it this time. And no matter how you say it or what you have to say, we want to hear about it. Text us at 208-321-5614. Your comments, your concerns, your complaints, we want to hear from you. Doesn't matter what. Hashtag the 208. Check one, two, check, check.
All right, well, if you missed it just a few moments ago, we announced Paulette Jordan announced she is running for U.S. Senate. She's among a few others trying to beat Senator Jim Risch for that seat at the U.S. Capitol. And Joe, you just got off the phone with Paulette Jordan to kind of talk about how this is all going to play out. What did she have to say to you? Well, the bottom line is that she's very excited for another statewide race and she's not being shy. Uh, okay. In the conversation I had with her, she called out Senator Risch by name and well, we'll play it back for you right now. Paulette Jordan joins us now. Paulette, a big announcement earlier today, running for U.S. Senate. We'll start with this, Paulette. Why are you running for U.S. Senate? Well, first, thanks, Joe, for taking my call. I appreciate this opportunity. I feel this, that uh, this happens is a better fit for me. Uh, I'm already a nationally recognized leader with uh, national uh, connections and uh, have been working on uh, multiple fronts uh, across the country. Uh, and number two, I feel that our current Senator Rich is simply falling asleep at the wheel, and we could do better. We need a leader who's going to be paying attention. Well, Senator Risch put out a statement um, in response to you joining the race today. He said in part, all of them, them being the candidates, have a clear desire to advance the liberal socialist agenda. He ends up saying that Idahoans will have a clear choice at the ballot box this November. What's your reaction to Senator Risch's statement from his campaign? I think Senator Risch uh, certainly has a, a lot on his plate uh, at the moment, but he, he certainly needs to be paying better attention to the voices of the people he represents. Uh, it's wholly unfortunate that he feels that way because he's looking at a candidate in myself who represents Idaho more fairly and clearly. Uh, I stem from uh, thousands of years of the people who are closest to this land and who have had uh, full faith and guided leadership that uh, extends out to the people and into the future. And I stand on not only the morals, but that connection to the people on land. I think that's very important when you have representation who's willing to stand up for not only fiscal conservatism, but also for representation of our environment and our neighbors and our communities. Uh, but two, uh, another challenge that I see uh, is that we face someone who you know, has been a problem, uh, not only in his representation with uh, lacking decision-making, but also having raised our national debt. So without uh, that uh, Having a, not having a, a representative who's going to represent us accountably, that will continue to be a challenge for all of us. Uh, for me, I'm coming in as a fiscal conservative, and I want to make sure that we are upholding uh, our fiduciary accountability once elected, and I will definitely make sure uh, that we are going to address the debt issue that he has created. Senator Risch's name has been almost synonymous with the impeachment that was going on until a few days ago. How, have you, how would you have voted on the impeachment of Donald Trump. Like Senator Mitt Romney, you know, I felt that he was someone who took the time through prayer, uh, and like myself, I'm very uh, based on prayer, so I really appreciate that he did that uh, and took the time to listen to his people, his constituents who also see that there's a problem in our current president and uh, wanted to see him tried for this case, and the people have a right to hear out the evidence and, and through this trial, so I would have definitely support of the trial uh, and to hear out the evidence the way that it should have been uh, played out for the people. And that's what you would call transparency and integrity. Similar to the governor's race, this will be a statewide race and it's no secret. State of Idaho, very red. In the governor's race, you lost by over 100,000 votes. This time, how do you plan on, you know, chipping away at that? Well, just like I did in my first race, uh, you know, you have to get out and meet the people and the the challenge is not money. It's basically being able to meet as many folks you know, from all walks of life across this great state. You have to take the time to go into people's homes or meet them in their communities. And that's what I plan to do is meet more of our neighbors and ensure that they are able to hear the concept and the whole list of concepts that we offer. And uh, this concept is what I stand for. So you heard it there, Brian. She's she's ready to go. And I think what we saw a few years ago when she was running for governor, for she had that uh, that primary election against AJ Belukov, and very quickly she started to gain a lot of followers mm -hmm. and passionate followers. And she mentioned in that interview that for her it wasn't about the money; it was about meeting the people. And I don't think uh, she ever had trouble with that. If you ever been to a Paulette Jordan event or a rally or even something that she's not at, she has such loyal supporters. It'll be interesting to see who sticks around from that governor's race from 2018 and who's still here in 2020 and that, you know at the same time you could assume maybe they followed her the entire time yeah and as she mentioned in one of the answers she gave you her name is known on a national front 
but it matters more in the state of Idaho. We'll see if that plays out any differently than, as you mentioned, during the governor's race two years ago. So. And we talked about Senator Risch. Yep. Again, he had this statement uh, earlier today. Uh, we got this again from his campaign, and he said again in part that he looks forward to putting his record of fiscal conservatism, common sense solution, and proven leadership against any one of the individuals. The individuals, Brian, the four uh, people that have entered the race so far. Four Democrats, one constitutional party, one independent. Now the games begin. Yes, they do. All right, All thanks, right. Joe. Hey, it's time for the weekend. Let's talk about that specifically, especially this storm on Saturday. It comes through early in the morning. The biggest part of it will be around 7 to 8 o'clock, which will give us a shower. There could be a little mixture of rain or snow, and it could still be isolated after that to about noon. Next surge comes in later in the afternoon, about 5 to 6 o'clock. It's going to cool us down to 42 for the high. We'll still keep some of the temperatures. We're up to 55 today, by the way. As you see, the overnight low will be down to about 36 degrees. So look for a little rain still mixed in in the morning, but in the afternoon, it'll be a rain shower. Dries up after that. This is a pretty simple forecast. Look at Sunday. It's dry 41. Temperatures start to kind of moderate a little bit because we're going to have quite a bit of sunshine for next week. So anticipating that all the way through Thursday, it's dry with temperatures in the 40s, but watch these lows. They're basically going to be in the 20s. And then next Friday, we could be back to a chance of some showers that could be putting a little bit more snow in the mountains. Now, we talk about these showers for tomorrow. Let me mention, too, that the winds will be blowing again overnight as well as into tomorrow. McCall could still see about another one to two inches of snow for late tonight as well as early tomorrow morning. Maybe even a little rain mixed in in some spots with it. And of course, around the area, because of such a variance in temperatures, there's an avalanche warning around the mountains of McCall. So just watch for that. You'll see down here through the valley, the winds aren't too bad, but they start picking up from Mountain Home all the way to Twin Falls. As you look at tomorrow morning, there's the first chance of showers about six in the morning and some breezy conditions will make it feel a little chilly if you're going to be going out on a Friday night. Now during the day tomorrow, there's that chance of shower again. I'd say it's about four to five o'clock. Keeps our temperature down to about 41. Winds will be west to northwest anywhere from about 10 to 20 miles an hour. Now as you take a look at this future cast, uh, you'll see for tonight that we remain dry and we're going to continue through tomorrow. Here's midnight tonight in the morning. There's that shower I was talking about and there's a little mixture of a rain or snow. Now in the afternoon it breaks up about nine o'clock. And then after that, we get another isolated shower off the mountains. And then you'll see that we have another spot there probably just a little later that afternoon. Let me just run this into Sunday. Now, when we go into Sunday, you see everything dries up, even in the mountains, and it's all gone. And boy, I'll tell you what, we're going to have several dry days as we get into next week. And have a great weekend. I know, I know, I messed it up more than once. But how do you say it? We'll tell you in our new 208 segment. Spreading the love more than 2,000 times. What these high school students are doing for each other that will make your Friday.
Mel says the picture taken up by Wallowa Lake heading towards Hell's Canyon. Hey, Brian, it's pronounced Wooloo Lake in the Wooloo Mountains. Wooloo Lake. I like that. Still didn't get it. A lot of you tried to correct me not once, but twice. I butchered that name yesterday, which has us asking the question, how do you say it? Well, for the answer, we went right to the source. A woman who was born there, lives there, is actually in charge of the History Museum in town to find out how do you say it. You were born there? Yes. 86 years ago. So you kind of know a little bit about the place. I kind of do, uh-huh. <laughs> well, first of all, tell me what the name means. It means a fish trap in the river. It's a Nez Perce word for fish trap. Okay. And it's pronounced Wallawa. Wallawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and natives tend to drop the last, <laughs> they say Wallow, but you can sort of tell a native by when they just say Wallow, but it is Wallawa. To be fair, some of the Northwest names can kind of run together. From Wallula to Walla Walla, Wallawa just sounded right. So I guess it's not completely my fault for messing it up. No. Oh, no. <laughs> there, are, there are many, many people mess that word up. <laughs> but I won't anymore. I now know how you say Wallawa, Oregon. Nailed it. All right, before you start sending a message, I know it's Oregon. I know. Wallawa, just four hours from Boise, by the way, and I hear it is beautiful. Marianne, by the way, Boise State graduate, taught school in Ontario and Payette, but she moved back to where she was born many years ago. Wallawa. Nailed it. All right. Well, you all keep sending them in. We keep getting a kick out of them. You haven't disappointed when it comes to signs you've seen around the 208. This one from Jason in Boise reminds us of the old adage, give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. Can you claim to be a bicycle friendly community when the accommodations set aside for said bikes comes to an abrupt end in just a couple pumps on the pedal? Oh, it's fair to put a limit on friendship, but the city of Meridian seems to measure it in just a few feet. See any signs out there that make you laugh or just say, hmm, I wonder what that's all about. Or maybe there's a name out there in the 208 you aren't quite sure how to say. I'm sure you're not alone. Let us know about it. We're going to help you figure it out. Send those signs and those names our way. They could end up on the 208. We'll be right back.
Valentine's Day just one week away. While most of us haven't even thought about making plans, I will say gas station flowers still a pretty good idea. Kids and student council at Centennial High School have been thinking about it since the beginning of this year. Why? Because every year for the last five years, they've made personalized handwritten Valentines for every student. At last check, Centennial's enrollment sits at around 2,000, a little more than 2,000. So check out this time lapse of them putting up those Valentines in the school's main stairway this week. Rebecca McWilliams, Centennial Student Council Advisor, says they've been handwriting these hearts for the last three weeks. Yeah, talk about getting a jump on the holiday. This year, leaders of Centennial's English Language Learners Group stepped in to help. And McWilliams says the reception, always a positive one. The students love finding their name on the walls. So maybe we can take a page out of Centennial's book and make everyone feel loved this Valentine's Day. We'll be right back with a look at some of your comments that you sent in during the show. Some of them kind of like this one here. Time now to get to some of your responses you sent in during the show. This one from Paula. Thank you for airing the interview with Paulette Jordan. She is well spoken. Uh, Pass that one too far. Anyway, just thank you for doing that. And she represents Idaho well. That's what Paula had to say. But then we also have this. There are at least three other candidates running against Senator Risch. Will they receive the same amount of coverage as Mrs. Jordan? We're going to try to get to those as many as we can. That's kind of how we work. We try to give equal time to uh, all of the candidates or as many as we can. As for this. Thank you for remembering my grandfather, Bert Miller, U.S. Senator from Idaho. More importantly, though, he served as Attorney General and Supreme Court Justice for many, many years. He was well respected, and everyone just called him Bert, even as a Democrat, and they worked across the aisle. He died almost sitting in his station. That is from his son, Bert Miller II. Thank you for sending that in, and a great memory of your father. Last one to get to, Rick is dampening the two-way vibe with that necktie, that silly necktie. Maybe... He could use it as a headband. What do you say, Rick? Headband? I use Monday? it to hang my microphone. He uses it to hide his... He's also working on the weathercast for the news at 6. We'll see you back here on Monday.